All right, so now let's take a hands-on example that's still in a general sense. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a random coordinate system somewhere here. So I have an X and a Y coordinate system. And within that coordinate system, I now gonna put a random shape. So let's pretend that I have a shape that looks like this. And then maybe a circle, semicircle here. Okay. And so our goal in the future will be to understand where is the centroid location of this. So let's say I need to find, find this point which has coordinates pretty much x tilde and y tilde for the total shape. So let's pretend this here would be x tilde. And then this here would be y tilde. And to get that, what we have to do is look at our formula here on the top right. So I'm going to highlight those for you. So these two formulas here on the top is really what we need. So let me highlight those for you. And the way we're going to use them now is we want to identify individual areas with their individual centroid distance. So keep in mind that usually you only know where this location is, you don't know where this is. In fact, this is what you're after. You want to find where is that centroid location of this entire shape. And this is my formula that will help me to do that. So the first thing I have to do now is to discretize it into these areas. So let me show you that. So for example, I have a rectangle here that could go in this direction here. And that rectangle, I'm going to call my A1, right? So I'm going to call this here A1. And I'm going to call my triangle A2 and my circle or semicircle A3. And each one of them have an individual centroid location. So for example, A1 is exactly here in the middle. Then A2 has it at the third point and third point. So that would be somewhere here, let's say. And then the semicircle has it located somewhere there. And I'll be honest with you, for a circle, I don't know this distance from here to here from the top of my head. I will in a second write that down for you. But this is something you can find uh, tabulated in textbooks or like on the Internet, obviously, nowadays. But right now we're talking about the concept of how to use this formula. So let me continue with the X, I and the y tilde i, I should say, x tilde i and y tilde i. So that's what I'm going to define now for each of these next shapes. So let's start with my a1. So my a1, for example, has an x i that goes from here to here, x tilde i, I should say. And then it has a y tilde i, y tilde 1, actually, I should call this. And to make this correct, let's actually fix the overall one here. So that would only go up to here. And now let's talk at the about the other ones. So keep in mind that you are looking at the coordinate origin and that you want to define everything from the coordinate origin. So now comes the first trick or the first thing that's probably not immediately obvious. And that is that X tilde 2 would be the distance from here to here. So that would be X tilde 2. And Y tilde 2 would be the distance from the origin to the centroid of that shape. So this would be Y tilde 2. Let's continue with shape number three. Since I'm here on the right side, I'm going to continue there with the Y tilde. So my Y tilde would really be this distance from here to here. 
y tilde 3. And then last but not least, our x tilde 3 would be the distance from the origin to the individual centroid location of that shape. And it's important to understand that here on purpose I drew the centroid location a little bit further to the right than this one and this one because these will be exactly in the middle of this entire shape here. But this will move a little bit to the right because if you add this triangle here on the side it will have to move, it brings the entire weight of the entire system further to the right. But once again, the important, here, the important thing here is that you understand the connection between these two formulas, specifically what is AI and XI and y, uh, y tilde I in relation to this picture. And so let me repeat that for you one more time. You always want to identify individual shapes, for example, shape one, and then you can easily calculate the area content. And then you also know where the centroid location of that individual shape is located relative to your point of origin. And that's very important. So the way I call this distance here, for example, x tilde 1, is the distance between the individual shape centroid and the origin of the coordinate system. And for this shape here, it's usually very simple and easy for students to follow, but it becomes a little bit more tricky when the shape itself is not attached to the centroid location, sorry, to the origin of the coordinate system. So for example, this shape here. So for this shape, we have the distance here being one third. In fact, let me maybe include that here. So you would have, let's say, this distance being, let's say B. So this here would be b times 2 over 3, whereas this here would be one third b, right? And so if now I also give another distance to this shape here, let's say this would be, I don't know, w white, then my x two, tilde 2 would be equal to w plus one third b. And that is important to understand how that works. And that concept works continuously for each of these problems. So let's talk about a few hiccups that sometimes happen when applying these formulas or questions that I often get from students. For example, a common thing is like, hey, why can I not just find all my individual elements and then just sum them up and divide it by the total area? And that is not possible because here in this formula, we are talking about a summation of many multiplications. So for example, you have to find the x i x tilde i1 and a i1, multiply them with each other, and then do this for x tilde 2 and a2, multiply them with each other, and then add them together. And that is different than just summing up everything that you find here on the top. So that is a common hiccup that um, students experience or a common confusion that students have initially. But because you have the multiplication here on the top, you cannot just blindly sum up everything and divide it the, the complete summation by the total area. Or like some students even think they come to me and say, hey, why does this not cancel out because I have a total here on the bottom and a lot of a's on the top that together will give me the a total. But again, it's the multiplication here that prevents you from crossing those out from each other. So that is a common confusion. So please keep that in mind. Of course, that applies to both of these formulas. And so to get the complete answer here on the bottom or to for completeness reasons, I probably also should then here add that a total is equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3. And let's talk conceptually about a few things here real quick before we move on to problem solving. So if I look back at this formula, what do I get? My x tilde i is in millimeters or in meters, whichever unit you want to use, but it's a length unit. Let's say millimeters here. And then my ai is usually in millimeters square 
right? And it has to be in the same dimensions. And you divide it by area, which is also in millimeters squared. And that's why at the end, you end up with millimeters. So that, of course, is something we know from our last lecture. But we know that the x tilde or the x bar, sorry, is needs to be in a length unit, right? So x bar needs to be in length unit. And the same is true for y bar. So that also needs to be in millimeter. But millimeter, I'm just using here as an example. In reality, it's a length, length units, right? So that is concept number one. Last but not least, what would happen if you were to drill a hole somewhere in this shape? So let's pretend I'm drilling a hole right here. So this is my hole. And now I have removed material from this location. And that means that hole shifts the centroid location. So if I look at this before drilling the hole, the centroid location was right here. Now I drilled a hole to the left of the centroid. That means that effectively I have more material on the right than I have on the left. And therefore my centroid would move to the right side. So let's take a note of that. And let's say that if I have an, a hole, which is a negative area, if you will, I would have to subtract it here, right? So this distance would still be positive or this distance would still be positive. This would be a negative area. And I also have to subtract it here. So it can happen that you have to deal with the summation of negative parts in this equation and that can be possible so let's write that down so holes in shape are considered negative areas and must be subtracted So that is important to understand. And I think with that, we have covered all our bases for these types of problems. Of course, at the end, it only comes through practice, but I believe we have deciphered these two formulas now and we have conceptually derived every component of them. Now it's a question of how we apply that and we will practice that on the next page.